verdict count one sexual battery we the jury impaneled and sworn in the above entitled cause do upon our oaths find as follows defendant is guilty of the crime of sexual battery and set punishment at eight years your honor please do not send me to prison i have room but i'm not ruined do you believe that eric de Wagner saved your life on december 19th december 3rd 2019 there are tissues behind you. Yes. We're supposed to be able to trust police officers to keep us safe. They are the people that we depend on to help us when we are in danger. But sometimes, sadly, it is police officers themselves that are the true danger to our safety. The following stories tell the tale of 10 corrupt police officers who thought they were above the law and did some pretty horrific things. These individuals are now paying the price for their actions by spending the rest of their lives behind bars. Daniel Holtzclaw was a member of the Oklahoma City Police Department who used his power as a law enforcement officer to manipulate and harm African American women between December 2013 and June of 2014. He would purposefully search for women who had active warrants out or who had been in trouble with the law before. He would also specifically look for women of low income communities. Once he found his targets, he would take advantage of them and forced them to do things against their will. His victims included eight different women. It wasn't until June 18th, 2014, that he would make the mistake that would ultimately cost him not only his career, but his freedom. While driving back to his home in his police-issued vehicle, Daniel would end up making a traffic stop. But he did not report this traffic stop to the police dispatch, as is procedure. Instead, he quickly ran the records for the driver before logging off his computer. The driver of this vehicle was a 57-year-old woman named Janie Liggins. Janie was from a poor area, like the rest of the women that Daniel would usually target. However, she had no prior criminal record and was not afraid to report him for what he forced her to do. This included not only forcing her to take off her clothes, but to then perform an intimate act on him. Throughout the horrific ordeal, Janie was terrified and would later say that she begged him to spare her life. The following day, Daniel was brought in for questioning. He was interviewed for two hours, during which time he completely denied everything that happened with Janie. He claimed he pulled over Janie because he saw her vehicle swerved. He then said that she appeared nervous and even crying. She was also unable to provide him with a valid driver's license. He explained that he had Janie step out of the vehicle so that he could pat search her. Did your hands go on her at all? I backhanded, I backhanded her on as far as the side. Where on her body? Tell me. You back her hand. waist, her waist, and the back portion. I didn't touch her butt or anything, but the back portion and the waist. And then she lifted it up like right here. The investigator, who has been playing extremely friendly so far, finally breaks it to Daniel that Janie has accused him of sexual misconduct. But showing how much experience as an investigator she really has still led Daniel to believe that she believed he had done nothing wrong. Well, was there anything? An accidental touch at anything. If she thought it uh, when I passed her, Drew, but I, it was nothing as far as I felt like I would do anything as far as or anything like that. For my safety, I just checked to see the weapons or anything. At the conclusion of the interview, the interrogators came to the conclusion that they believed he was being untruthful and he was soon removed from the force. He was arrested in August 2014 and eventually charged with 36 counts of different offenses. During the trial, DNA taken from one of the victims, who was an underage girl, was traced back to Daniel. The case was brought before a jury and he was convicted. Count eight. Defendant is guilty of the crime of forcible oral sodomy and punishment is set at 20 years. <laughs> Count nine, in the first degree. Defendant is not guilty of the crime of in the first degree. In total, Daniel was sentenced to 253 years behind bars. He is now 36 years old and remains behind bars. Derek Siobhan was a former police officer from Minneapolis, Minnesota. He is infamously associated with the death of George Floyd, an unarmed African-American man 
Prior to the death of George Floyd, Derek had 18 different complaints on his record. On May 25th, 2020, George was accused of trying to use a counterfeit $20 bill at a market. When Derek and other officers arrived, they claimed that George tried to resist being arrested. Body camera footage that later came out showed Derek kneeling on George's neck for a significant period of time. During that time, George could be heard crying out that he couldn't breathe. George would eventually die in police custody. Several bystanders witnessed these events and recorded videos that were shared online. These videos sparked massive outrage throughout the country and many people began to march in protest. Derek was later arrested and charged with third degree murder and manslaughter and was eventually found guilty by a jury trial. As sentence for count one, the court commits you to the custody of the Commissioner of Corrections for a period of 270 months, that's 270. That is a 10 year addition to the presumptive sentence of 150 months. This is based on your uh, abuse of a position of trust and authority. Michael Dotro is a former police officer from New Jersey who set fire to the home of another police officer that was superior to him. The officer and his family were asleep in the home at the time. Luckily, they managed to escape the burning home with their lives. Michael was charged and convicted of attempted murder and has since been called a monster for his horrific actions. He was sentenced to 20 years in prison behind bars. Considering his age, it is possible he will not be seeing life as a free man again. The judge chastised him, telling him that he caused immense harm, not only on the victims and their family, but to all of the community. He also sent a message that there are officers who cannot be trusted, despite what their badges might say. The only way I can make I can make sense of the sentencing, and I also want everyone to understand where I'm coming from with regards to this, especially if there's going to be any appellate review of the sentence. I want those judges to know the sentence to be imposed in this particular case is because Mr. Dotro, through his conduct and his admissions, spanning from 1998 to this year represents the worst that we can possibly expect from someone in our society. Zach Wester is a former North Florida deputy. He was found guilty of planting narcotics on innocent drivers who had done nothing wrong. In most cases, these people were pulled over for minor traffic offenses, only to soon be carried off to jail for narcotics charges. There were 27 different victims in this case who suffered tremendously as a result of Zach's actions. Zach who is the son of a prominent lawman, was initially praised by the community for the number of arrests that he was able to make. The only problem was that many of those arrests were totally bogus charges. It wasn't until the summer of 2018 that prosecutors began to think something fishy was going on with Zach and his arrests. They saw inconsistencies in what he was putting on police reports and what was being shown in his police body cam videos. In one particular video, Zach could be seen carrying a plastic baggie in his hand before searching a woman's pickup truck. He then arrested her for the that he planted. Zach was eventually arrested in 2019 and found guilty of racketeering, fabricating evidence, misconduct, false imprisonment, and possession of drugs and paraphernalia. He denied any wrongdoing. The drugs were there. I did not put the narcotics there. Watch Zach question an innocent man after he planted drugs in his vehicle. You can only imagine how scared and confused this victim must have been. It appears to be an illegal narcotic. Do you know anything about that? I do not. The victims had an opportunity to speak ahead of Zach's sentencing. Gee, Mr. Wester, you've robbed me of my credibility being a mother and a grandmother for the last three years. I've probably missed a year and a half of my grandbaby's life because of this. Um, I wish you no ill will, and you'll never know what you've done to me until you have children of your own, so. Zach, dressed in an orange jumpsuit and wearing a face mask, could be seen wiping away tears as his sentence was read aloud. Zach was sentenced to 12 and a half years behind bars. 
Eric DeValconaire is a former police detective from Kansas City, Missouri. On December 3rd of 2019, he shot and killed Cameron Lamb, an unarmed black man. The shooting occurred at Cameron's home. He and his partner, Troy Schwalm, reportedly entered Cameron's property with no warrant and without the homeowner's permission. There was no active pursuit and no apparent reason for Cameron to have been detained. He did own a gun, but it was found on the floor of the garage not on his person. Also, prior to the shooting, Troy said that he saw Cameron's hands on the steering wheel of his vehicle. In other words, he was not holding a gun or presenting any threat. Eric was charged with involuntary manslaughter. Friends and family members of George Floyd, Jacob Blake, and Oscar Grant are in town for the trial. We're not asking, we're demanding. We come in from all over the country we're not going to stand still and let's th let this continue to happen to us over and over again. In the end, a judge, not a jury, will decide DeValconeer's fate. The trial was very controversial. One particularly emotional moment was when Troy Schwalm took to the stand to talk about the events that occurred leading up to Cameron's death. Sergeant Schwalm, do you believe that Eric DeValconeer saved your life? on December 19th, it's December 3rd, 2019. There are tissues behind me. Yes. Sergeant Troy Schwalm's face was twisted up, holding back tears. The charge against Eric DeVolcanier is involuntary manslaughter, a death as the result of recklessness. The prosecutor had harsh words for Eric's actions leading up to Cameron's death. Careful and responsible police officers protect our citizens in their own homes careless and irresponsible police officers citizens in their own homes. Cameron Lamb was slowly backing into his garage when the two officers ran through the yard at him. The prosecution says DeVolcanier fired four shots into Lamb's truck, killing him. Even though Sergeant Schwamm says Eric shot Cameron to save his life, it's not clear why Eric felt the need to shoot him at all, because there was no perceived threat. Cameron was on his own property and wasn't doing anything wrong. He has no warrant. He has no probable cause. No information about any crime other than a traffic offense. But the defense said that Eric and Troy had pursued Cameron because he was driving recklessly at speeds exceeding 90 miles an hour. He also had two children in the back of his vehicle. He had been chasing after his girlfriend at the time, but ultimately made the decision to discontinue the chase and return back to his house. This still doesn't explain why Eric thought shooting Cameron was necessary. Back in 2019, police said crime scene investigators found Lance left arm hanging out the window and a gun on the ground below it. Schwalm testified he did not hear a gun drop to the ground. The prosecution accused Eric of planting a gun on the garage floor to make it look like he actually had a reason to and kill Cameron. Eric denied this. He tearfully explained what he said happened leading up to Cameron's death. He could barely get the words out. He takes his left hand with the gun and as he brings it along up and around the left hand side of the steering wheel is when I My focus moves from that weapon to the center of his chest. I'm still. No information about a crime. The prosecutor grilled him about entering the home without a warrant. No, no weapon of any kind that were in your mind that you knew about. No information like that at the time. You are now entering private property without a warrant, without probable cause, with your gun drawn. True? As all officers in my situation would have done. But the defense tried to paint Eric as a hero who did what he had to do in order to save Troy's life. Did you have time to get a warrant? No, I did not. Did you have a duty to protect your partner? Yes, I did. And do you believe that you ultimately saved his life? Yeah. Yes, I do. The prosecutor discussed how little time Eric took before making the decision that would ultimately lead to Cameron's death. Nine seconds from the time you start to encounter this individual without a probable cause, without a warrant, without knowing what crime, before you pull the trigger. Nine seconds. Before he presents the weapon in a threatening manner, correct? Yes, nine seconds. 
Yes. Ultimately, it would be up to the judge presiding over the case to determine whether or not this was manslaughter or a matter of self-defense. The court is further compelled to find beyond a reasonable doubt that when defendant shot and killed Cameron Lamb, number one, defendant was not acting in lawful self-defense. Number two, defendant was not acting in lawful defense of Sergeant Schwamm. And three, it being conceded that defendant and Sergeant Schwamm were not effecting an arrest of Cameron Lamb or preventing his escape after an arrest. The judge ended up declaring that Eric and Sergeant Schwamm broke the law by even coming onto the property in the first place. And that escalated the situation in a way that it never needed to be. He also said that they exhibited negligence and poor judgment. At this point, Troy knows that things are not looking good for him, but watch his reaction as the official verdict is read aloud. As to count one, in which defendant is charged with the class C felony of involuntary manslaughter in the first degree, the court finds the defendant guilty of the lesser included offense of involuntary manslaughter in the second degree, a class E felony. As to count two, the unclassified felony of armed criminal action, the court finds the defendant guilty. Eric appeared to be blinking rapidly, but kept a straight face as he learned his fate. However, when the court concluded, he could be seen glancing at his lawyer and mouthing something before putting his head down in despair. In the background, you can hear what appears to be cheering coming from outside the courtroom, likely a reaction to the verdict. On Friday, March 4th, 2022, the judge would sentence Eric for his crime. The class E felony of involuntary ma manslaughter in the second degree, I sentence you to a term of incarceration in the Missouri Division of Adult Institutions of three years. On the unclassified felony of armed criminal action, I sentence you to a term of incarceration of six years in the Missouri Department of Corrections. Those cases, or rather those counts and sentences will run concurrent with one another for a total term of incarceration of six years. Unless an appeal is approved, Eric will remain behind bars for the next six years. Following sentencing, the judge did point out that despite there being a lot of civil unrest around the time of this crime associated with police officers shooting unarmed black men, this was not comparable to the George Floyd case. He didn't have any history of violence and he didn't hunt Cameron down. However, his actions are still the reason why Cameron is no longer alive. Cameron Lamb is dead. Eric DeValconer killed him. And the court has found that that happened because the defendant acted without considering or being aware of the substantial and unjustifiable risks associated with his conduct and that his actions were a gross deviation from the standard of care that a reasonable person would exercise in the situation. Cameron Lamb's parents spoke out after watching their son's killer get brought to justice. They were satisfied with the sentence that Eric received. It was a fair decision. He still got a year for every second, them nine seconds. I don't care if you put them together or not. He got four, three years for one and he got six years for another. So that's a year for each of them seconds that it took him to get so reckless with that gun of his. Cameron's parents also expressed wanting to spread awareness about the dangers of police recklessness in hopes that no more innocent people need to be killed by cops acting on impulse instead of rational thinking. As for now, Eric remains behind bars. Charlie Reeder was once the sheriff of Pike County in Ohio. He was well known and respected when he became the face of an investigation into the worst crime county the state had ever seen, the Rodin Massacre. In this case, one family killed eight members of another family. But in 2021, Sheriff Reeder was arrested and charged with theft and corruption, as well as tampering with evidence. He pleaded guilty. He was given a chance to speak before he was sentenced was handed down. He apologized for his actions and asked for forgiveness. I stand here before you today to take accountability for the, my actions. As a sheriff of Ohio, I shed, <clears throat> excuse me, I shed bad light on the office of sheriff. I can only ask that my staff, their families, the community, and my family who is here today 
will forgive me for the undue stress I caused them. For this, I am terribly sorry. He also asked for no prison time so that he could spend time with his aging parents while they were still alive. He begged to be sentenced to community service instead. Your Honor, please do not send me to prison. I have wronged, but I'm not ruined. I still have a lot of good left in me. I thank you for your time. The judge didn't seem affected by his tears and ultimately sentenced him to three and a half years in prison. He was released early in May of 2023. David Oliver was once the police chief of Brimfield, Massachusetts. He first became the chief in 2004 and was widely loved and respected. He has a book called No Mopes Allowed. He also had a big following on social media and hosted a talk show. But everything changed in January of 2015 when he was forced to abruptly resign from his position. A female officer from his department had come forward and claimed that David had abused her emotionally, verbally, and physically. He pleaded no contest and was found guilty of a theft and unlawful restraint. In court, the female officer who had spoken out against him had a chance to share her story. Once again, I was painfully naive. I remember the first time David Oliver hugged me. It made me uncomfortable. I really liked him, but I wanted to make sure that the boundaries were clear. When I first started at Brimfield, another female officer tried to warn me. She told me to watch the chief and explain that he could get physically way over the line. He was very handsy, she, she, she said. I reassured her that I don't do that kind of thing, so I'd be fine. Would the judge throw the book at David or have mercy on the man, once so loved by the community? On the attempted theft in office, misdemeanor of the first degree, I'm going to sentence the defendant to 180 days of Fort County Jail. On the simple assault misdemeanor in the first degree, I'm going to sentence the defendant to 180 days in Portage County Jail. On the unlawful restraint misdemeanor of the third degree, I am going to sentence the defendant to 60 days in Portage County Jail. On the unauthorized use of property misdemeanor of the first degree, I am going to sentence the defendant to 180 days in jail. Those sentences will run encourage one another. In total, he was sentenced to 20 months in prison for his crimes, followed by two years of probation, during which time he would not be permitted to drive. He also had to give up his certification to serve as a police officer. Since that time, David has been released from jail and is trying to rebuild his reputation as a public figure. He started a new business and began posting on his popular Facebook page once again. In an interview following his release from prison, he said he was trying to be a better person and viewed his time behind bars as God putting him in a timeout. Marcus Eberhardt was a former sergeant from Atlanta. One of the other officers that were with them attempted to put Gregory into handcuffs, but before he could, the suspect ran off into the woods. An officer managed to catch up to him and then successfully put him into handcuffs. When trying to get up, Gregory stumbled and then eventually fell. He was told to get up again, but said that he was too tired. It was then that Marcus told Howard that if the suspect didn't want to get up, then and he should just tase him. Gregory attempted once more to get up, but when he fell to the ground, both Marcus and Howard tased him. Paramedics were called to the scene, but by the time they arrived, Gregory's heart had stopped beating. He was pronounced dead. Marcus was charged with murder, and Howard was charged with involuntary manslaughter. Former East Point police officers will head to prison. A Fulton County judge handing down the sentences for former Sergeant Marcus Eberhardt and former Corporal Howard Weems after a jury found them guilty in the 2014 tasing death of Gregory Towns. Mark received a life sentence while Howard received just 18 months behind bars. Following the sentencing, Azel Smith, the girlfriend of Gregory Towns, said that looking back, she wished she never would have called the police that day, that their coming was simply a disaster. She also says she carries a lot of guilt over what happened. She believes if she hadn't called the police, Gregory would still be here. I don't want to hear anything he has to say. I just really don't want to hear anything he has to say. Um, 
Gregory's not here to respond for himself, so I did it for him. Reports say that Gregory was tased a total of 13 times. The toll on his body was simply too great. Daniel Saylor was once a police chief in Orange County, Florida, but in 2011, he was fired from the force after using his power and connections to a sexual battery offense that was committed by one of his friends. His friend, a man named Scott Bush, committed sexual battery to a child under the age of 12 years old. Daniel was also accused of accepting a bribe in order to hire another officer who sold photographs taken at the site of Tiger Woods' car crash in 2009. Daniel Saylor dropped his head when he heard the guilty verdict. It was role reversal. Windermere's former chief of police was the man being fingerprinted and handcuffed. Daniel was charged with perjury and corruption. At sentencing, Daniel said that he did not know what to see in response to the verdict, but could only ask that the judge have mercy on him. But the judge ultimately sentenced him to eight years behind bars. Prosecutor Ryan Williams felt the sentence was justified. As I told the court every day in this courtroom, we depend on people telling the truth. And if you don't tell the truth, there has to be ramifications for that. Daniel has since been released from prison after serving the entirety of his sentence. Aaron Dean is a former police officer from Fort Worth. In 2019, he shot and killed a 28-year-old black woman named Atiana Jefferson. A neighbor had called and asked for a police officer to come out and do a wellness check at a home belonging to the victim's mother. When he arrived at the scene, then 38-year-old Aaron shot Atiana through a window. She had been in the living room playing video games with her eight-year-old nephew. Aaron resigned from the force and was later charged with manslaughter in Atiana's death. The very disturbing body cam footage from the incident was played in the courtroom. It showed Aaron approaching the house and eventually seeing Atiana inside. He yelled at her to put her hands up before immediately her. Aaron's partner, who was there that night, came forward to testify about what happened. Did you ever see a Tatiana's yeah. No, ma'am, my, my, I saw her face. That burned in your memory? Yes, ma'am. But when he was called forward to testify, Aaron insists he saw a Tatiana holding a gun and that he acted only in self-defense. What do you see? I just saw the silhouette of the person and the gun. I don't recall seeing hands, but I, I did see that weapon pointed at me. <laughs> You're not saying the gun's on the floor? No, the gun was pointed directly at me. And about how high up on the silhouette was the gun in your mind when you're looking at this? Maybe mid-chest? I'm, I'm not sure. Ultimately, the trial was put into the hands of the jury. He remained stone-faced and unemotional as the verdict was read aloud in the courtroom. Verdict reads, we the jury find the defendant Aaron, De Aaron York Dean guilty of the offense of manslaughter as signed and signed by the presiding juror. Aaron was ultimately sentenced to 11 years and 10 months behind bars. The family members of Atatiana Jefferson spoke highly of the young woman whose life was taken far too soon. She was described as a woman with a bright future who dreamed of attending law school and had a lot of plans for her life. Sadly, these were plans she was never able to accomplish. The main lesson to be learned from these stories of these 10 corrupt cops is that it doesn't matter how much power or how many connections you think you have. If you break the law and take advantage of people, you will one day have to pay the price, just as all these men have to. Thank you so much for watching, and don't forget to subscribe.